they just do it. They try shit. They go for it. They they go all out. There is, I want, almost want to say there's nothing like it, but I mean, being like at a rave, maybe at, you know, the center of the dance floor, just stamping your feet, that feels kind of similar. It's this energy in the room, 60 people who showed up, who clipped into the bike. Then we get going and then my energy is at a level where it pumps them up and it just <laughs> like explodes. We can just get going then and welcome to Rowan Aida, a wonderful personal trainer, Nike, official Nike trainer, founder of Elevate by yeah. Rowan. The, the reason you st stood out to me is like one of the most positive people I've ever seen on the internet. This vibe you get out is incredibly positive. Does it, does it take you long to get into this mood or are you always like that? <laughs> this is a great question. I am not the most... I want to say joyful person in the early, early morning, but it is a natural thing. It is a natural thing. It's not like, oh, I need my coffee or I need my, you know, I don't know. I just, I, in general, I'm pretty happy. I'm glad to hear that because that means you're not, you're not faking it when you're. No, no, I, I definitely, that's like one, um, core value and golden rule for my content. If I'm not feeling it, it's not going to happen. So I try to stay authentic, but also I have to be real with you. I am not the type of person who's going to grab the phone and like, kind of like, I don't know, capture a moment where I feel really down. Those are more the moments where I'm kind of reaching out to my people or my family or my partner where I can just like, oh, get everything out. Yeah, because I suppose there does seem to be, there's quite a bit of sharing of I've got sharing of miseries, maybe not a very nice way to put it, but people want to share. And I think it's a balance, isn't it? Because you want to admit that you feel like this, but do you necessarily want to be projecting that to people? Yeah, or capturing it. I don't know. Like, I, I just, I'm the type of person, if I feel like shit, to be honest, <laughs> if I don't feel great, I am going to sit with that feeling and I'm going to give myself space to feel it, but I'm not in a mood to capture it. I would later share like, hey, I had this week where I was feeling down and I wasn't feeling well and my energy was just not getting to a point where I could, you know, turn it into something positive. I would share that, but not necessarily the moment where I'm down or frustrated or insecure. Those are just moments where I feel like, okay, maybe I should take some time off screen, offline and just sit with this feeling. If you if you have those those times you you know that they pass right absolutely yeah and and honestly I'm getting better at understanding that it is a feeling it is a phase I don't have to identify with it I can let it be and I also start to understand more and more that if I get frustrated over feeling this way it's gonna last longer. That sometimes used to get me in a negative spiral where I'm like, I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to feel this way. I want to feel good. But then I realized, all right, this extra load that I'm putting on myself, this extra pressure that I'm putting on myself to feel good, which is not happening, is also not working out. When you look back, is there a, is there a time when you were younger that you saw this person sort of coming into being or were you always like a sporty person? Were you always working out? Yeah, I've always been a sporty person. I remember I started like taking dance classes the moment I <laughs> was standing on my feet. And I've always been super active. I'm not like, I don't, you know, my partner always laughs at me in the morning because he needs his morning coffee before he gets going. And I don't drink coffee. So <laughs> I mean, I got my water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. So I, it's because my natural energy is high. And the moment I take like coffee, I get, you know, my heart starts to rush and I feel uncomfortable. And I, I just have a lot of energy naturally. And I love to use that in movement or to move my body. Also, if you let me watch a movie like <laughs> of an hour and a half or two, it's just like, you need to it's good that my partner and I have been together for a while. He understands. Like, I just, you know, the positions are changing consistently. 
<laughs> there's no <laughs> no so always, always moving right always moving okay so uh, yeah I, I have this slightly because if, if i sit in front of a film i'm asleep by the end right <laughs> so and 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 my son will come up and start he'll start prying my eyes open like that but i find yeah like patting on the face and watching so is he watching is he watching <laughs> is he still yeah. There? so yeah i have to keep move i have to keep moving so so yeah so but you've managed to turn it into something positive right because otherwise you know when you're little this can be a problem right because children are kind of forced to sit still true were you true. like were you like a bit naughty as a child always or, or perceived as naughty not necessarily i would say but maybe teachers would not <laughs> agree if they hear this i'm not sure i mean i wasn't the type of person who would like be sent out of class or something until I was a teenager. But as a young kid, I just, I really used the moments that I could move my body to the max. Like, and my parents knew that I was, you know, an active kid. So I would dance a lot, whether it was at home or dancing classes. So I would use the energy well. And then during school, I could obey. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll take this moment. <laughs> and how did you get to the point of, of, of turning it into a, into a profession then. So you did dancing just for just for fun as a kid. But when 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 yeah. when did it, when did it become like something you thought, hang on, I can actually make a living out of this? So at the end of high school, I was still in this same dance academy. And then you get the opportunity to audition for the performing school of arts, which is like their kind of like college and university plan. It's a four-year study. I did my bachelor and my master's. And that's when you kind of decide like, all right, I'm going to take this into a professional direction. So I started, so I done, I done that bachelor and master in performing arts. And I actually started out touring with musicals as a dancer and a singer. And then I think I took on to that for like four years or something. And then, I don't know, along the way, I was craving a more routine based life because when you're touring you're touring through the country and you're barely at home you always have shows in the evening and i just kind of missed the quality time with my people with my friends with my family and so i realized you know i think it's going to be the last year that i'm going to be touring i think i was about 25 by then and that's when i realized all right well that means i'm going to have to start doing something else and I actually told myself, you know what? I'm just going to work at a gym. I'm often in the gym. I love to be there. I love to move my body. Let's just, you know, apply for a job there and then think about what I want to start doing in the meantime. But then kind of never left this fitness area and it really grew on me and it became more of a passion than dancing and, and singing ever was actually, which I never would have expected. So, so not just dancing as a kid. You've actually studied dance, and you're and you're uh, kind of this is, yeah. this is in Holland where you you still based, right? Actually, yeah, that's right, like, Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Yeah. Based. So you're kind of touring the country as a singer, singer dancer, like what in chorus lines, that kind of thing. I'm, yeah, exactly. This is me doing an impression of it. <laughs> sure. There was a lot of this. You can <laughs> you can tell I know a little bit about it, right? Well, maybe <laughs> you, have you studied it. too? Were you in my class? Yeah. I guess yeah, there was <laughs> a dance. Sorry. So it's so a dancing troupe. <laughs> a dancing troupe that would troupe. come after you. <laughs> yeah. So it was actually, yeah, musicals such as Saturday Night Fever or uh, Flesh Dance, Legally Blonde. Oh, what? Yeah, like kind of like the Broadway of the Netherlands, but. I have to be real, like, it's a very different theater scene that we have. We don't really have that Broadway, but we're just literally touring through the country because it's a tiny country. <laughs> it sounds like a sort of wild life being a, a traveling. Were you more of a singer? Were you a dancer first and a singer after? Or, or... Yeah, great question, actually. I definitely started off fully focused on dancing. And then I would often get... Uh, cover parts so like covering the lead so if they would not do the show you could take over their part which would be more of a singing part than dancing so it was really a combination of both 
but I would have considered myself more of a singer during my career than a dancer. Definitely. And do you still sing now? No. So this is actually a funny story. While I was started teaching classes and fitness classes, I used my voice in such a different way. There was a lot of passion involved, a lot of, I don't want to say screaming, but just a different way of using my voice because my muscles were tensed. So I couldn't really use my support system, which you usually use when you sing. So I started hurting my, my vocal cords. And while I was still doing few gigs in the weekends while I was working in a gym, I really had to make a choice. All right, like either I'm going to teach this week or I'm going to do my gig in the weekends. And then I I just actually kind of dropped the whole singing part. How long, how long since you sang in public? Sorry? How, how long now since you sang in public? Oh, um, last time must have been at 27 or 26. What are you now? You're thir- I'm now 32. Yeah, 32. About that. 32, right? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't guessing your age. I knew you'd said your de- on one of your videos, you said your date of birth more or less. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Something about being that would be a good uh, guess. <laughs> yeah, was, I was I knew rough roughly where we were. You bet never guess. You're never allowed to never guess. You can't yeah. guess. No. Yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Don't guess. I said, no, where were we? Okay, so a few years, a few years ago. Yeah, quite some years ago. And the crazy thing is, I don't miss it. Really? It it feels like when I'm teaching classes or teaching events or when I'm recording classes, that kind of feels like performing to me. I was going to say, I was going to say, they aren't your, you do teach in a very like performative way, (laughs) you know, and so much, so much energy going into it. So, so no, you would look at it and you you look like you've done something else before. So, so I say, so I guess for you that fills that void if there is a void or, or fulfills that need in you then when you're absolutely, absolutely. And the funny thing is, I know a lot of performers who later started teaching classes in fitness, and all of us kind of agree, or most of us agree, that you get this satisfaction out of moving your body with people and there's a difference of performing obviously if you're performing in a club or like a concert people get to move but i was in theater so the audience sits and there's this different chemistry between you and your audience or you and your fitness participant like your class participants your students when you are moving together and that is something that yeah really fulfills me a lot you move together you sweat together you yeah you kind of you're in that hustle together but you also achieve together it's very different than performing for an audience in theater it feels a lot more distant for me yeah i can see that particularly theater audiences can be a bit i don't know in britain i don't know in in holland but a bit reserved yeah a little bit stiff because you know, they're not there to join in they're just there yeah they're- watch to be entertained yeah, yeah and even with even with musicals which i'm a secret fan of by the way <laughs> not so secret anymore yeah <laughs> it's one of those things i i hate the idea of it and every time i go to a different one i really enjoy it yeah <laughs> you know, my wife books these things for the family i'm like oh god not for me and then i'm going there and generally i love it but yeah the, the audience can be quite kind of quite reserved I think even if you go and see something like Mamma Mia, which is, you know, like an ABBA sing-along. Yeah. So yeah, Yeah. but you can't do that in your fitness classes, can you? You can't just sit there and observe. (laughs) I mean, people are welcome to do what they want, (laughs) but it would be odd. (laughs) Do you, um, do you kind of, what's the, what's the word? Do you you encourage, politely encourage people or you just expect them to, take your example or if people because I guess you're doing you're doing a mix of online and in studio right that's right if if people are in the studio because I don't do the kind of classes that you do if someone's slacking at the back if someone's slow at the back you (laughs) point them out yeah (laughs) no um no actually main core value of my classes do what feels right to your body but allow yourself 
to discover and explore things you haven't done before. So I really encourage and invite people to challenge yourselves. And naturally, I have this chemistry with the people in class that they just do it. They try shit. They go for it. They they go all out. But I definitely have all levels in class. You know, there's people who come to class who maybe are recovering from an injury or who are pregnant or who just gave birth or who are not in the same physical state as some others might be are. And so I actually encourage people to take it at their pace. I don't believe that there is one way to get that feeling that I would desire them to have, which is just feeling good. My main reason of teaching my classes is I want you to feel at least 1% better than when you get off the bike or get off the mat and continue your day. So if that means, okay, I'm going to take it at a slower pace today, that's completely fine for me. There's no, I'm not like, it has to be this way. I think no, knowing how hard to push yourself is one of the tough things, you know, for people because uh, yoga classes, the yoga classes do a thing which I'd never seen anywhere else, which they go, you know, you the class is yours, you do you do whatever you can do. And when, if ever you don't feel like doing it, you can sit down and take a rest, which kind of works because I guess people have paid their money and they're there, they want to do it. But it contrasts that kind of the school thing of like making people make, which I think people probably fear for exercise. They're going to be made to do things they can't do, right? Yeah. You say you never know the physical state that people are in. Are most of your classes on the bike or? Um, it's a combination actually. So it's, it's really kind of 50, 50 at the moment. It will be classes, uh, in-person classes are usually on the bike and then online as well. There is cycle classes too. And then there's Pilates or Pilates high intensity version on the mat. And and what's most popular at the moment? Cycle is definitely, I mean, I gotta say both of them at the moment are really having this boost but cycle is just, it's incredible how much potential there is. Because for example, I teach a class for 60 people, 60 bikes in the room, and it's always packed. 60 bikes in the room. Yeah. That's huge. That's huge. And so that's different with Pilates, I would say, or at least in my uh, experience. Yeah, that is huge. And it's it's always packed and waitlisted and people are, yeah, it's such a popular workout at the moment that must be such a buzz though getting 60 people all pumping in the room must be amazing incredible there is i almost want to say there's nothing like it but i mean being like at a rave maybe at you know the center of the dance floor just stamping your feet that feels kind of similar and that's why it's so funny because there's almost it takes like literally almost 30 percent of the work that I naturally have to do as a trainer to encourage people or as a coach to encourage people to come along because it's this energy in the room, 60 people who showed up, who clipped into the bike, who are, you know, showing up with different moods, different energies, but then we get going. And then my energy is at a level where it pumps them up and it just <laughs> like explodes. Well, that leads me on to a question I'm I'm too British and embarrassed to ask, but I feel I have to. Because um, my friend comes to your classes, Marie, and um, she says you said something at the end of one of your classes that it was so intense that, forgive me if I'm, I shouldn't be quoting to this or I've got it wrong, that you had a tiny orgasm. <laughs> that definitely happened. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm saying no more on the matter. If you want to talk about it, you can. If you don't, we'll move on. You see, it's always dangerous. The things you say in class can be used against you. <laughs> we, we can we can fast forward this bit if you'd rather. I didn't mention it, but you know, I know Dutch no, people no. are a lot better at talking about things than we are. You know, we're exactly. very re- reserved. But <laughs> actually, I literally compared it to that, and I said, like, I think I said some. This must have been last week. I think I said something like, "Oh, feels like I had a teeny tiny orgasm." <laughs> And then I said, right after that, disclaimer, don't use this against me. (laughs) Uh, 
Don't tell anyone. Honestly. Don't, and don't mention it in public. Definitely. Don't mention it in public. And I also said, don't mention to my partner. You know, I don't think he wants to be compared to my cycle classes. <laughs> no, no, exactly. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, we 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 can move we can move on, but yeah, it's one of those things. It was one of those things. It's impossible to ignore. I said, "What?" She said, "What?" what? Yeah, wait, I have to check with her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's in tr- she's in trouble for maybe she's in trouble for sharing the secrets. Is it what happens in the studio stays in the studio? Right? <laughs> God knows what you people are up to in there. Yeah, a lot of crazy things happen in that room. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Did you launch? Did you launch your business right in the middle of the lockdown? Then is that? Yes, actually, elevate, elevate by Rowan. Um, my online business I launched during the the pandemic. I guess it was during the second lockdown. During the first lockdown, I started going live on Instagram, and this became a major hit. A lot of people started following me, started coming to the live sessions, and it was it was very fulfilling. It was very fun. Um, and then kind of, I think like we kind of got back to our regular routine, but after that first lockdown, you know, it was still a little bit tricky. And then during the second lockdown, I actually launched my app because I just decided like, this is so fun and it was going so well. Why not make this my personal brand, my, my business. And, um, yeah, that's still going. So was it as a reaction to um, pandemics and lockdowns or were you going to, were you going to do it then anyway? No, it was really a reaction. Yeah. I actually never, I just had moved to London that year and started working for a fitness company called soul cycle. And I really, I was loving it. I was enjoying every little bit of it. Started working with Nike at the time as well. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hit, and I just realized like, all right, whatever I'm doing in class must be possible, you know, to do this from home, from home to home. So I started doing those lives and then I realized, whoa, actually I'm loving this virtual experience as well. <laughs> I did have some experience already with teaching virtually for another app. So that kind of felt natural to work with the camera and to, you know, get the energy from yourself and not necessarily from people in the room, because there's definitely a lot you have to learn <clears throat> in that case. But yeah, I just said, you know what? I think this is an opportunity to launch my own business. And how long have you been working with Nike? Two years as a Nike global trainer. And before that, it was a different collaboration that we did. I think also for two years. So I would say like four, four years or five years in total now. Is it kind of like the Holy Grail to get to work with them? Like being a, what's the, what's the, what's the cycle one everyone's doing? You know, the um, uh, Peloton. Peloton. Is it like that sort of, it's kind of like one of the ultimate goals of fitness training? Excuse me. Yeah, it definitely, it is, it has been my main goal when I started as a coach, as a trainer, it was the number one thing that was on my vision board, like the big swoosh in the middle. I want to work as a Nike global trainer. So when that opportunity came onto my path, it was, it was mind blowing. It's an, it's an honor to work with them, to work for them, to create with them. They're very innovating. Yeah. And I feel like there is this curiosity always from Nike where they just want to, re- you know, they want to know what's happening in the fitness, what's happening in the industry, what's happening in your classes. And it's really fun to work with a company that's so innovating and that's so, yeah, seeking for growth and for change. And that's They're like pioneers for me. Pioneers, so. Yeah, pioneers, sorry, yeah. Do they support people who are doing their own thing at the same time? Major question, because honestly, that's been a huge obstacle for me with a lot of companies. And it's funny that the smaller players, the studios or gyms or upcoming brands are very tricky with non-compete. And, you know, like they don't want you to do your own thing until a certain range and Nike's kind of the opposite. They're looking for innovating people. They're looking for people who have started their own businesses or their own brand, who represent something, who create something. 
And so that collaboration goes a lot more smooth and they're actually very encouraging with, yeah, taking on your own path. And, and you know, you're just a part of this bigger global brand that can help you reach a major audience, but also they're interested in your knowledge and in your experience. So it's a very good balance between both. And that's good because you, I think people from the outside tend to think of the big corporates and I think, oh, well, they'll for, they'll want you to do everything their way and, and not do Absolutely. anything of your own. I think there's definitely situations where that might happen with bigger brands. But from my experience, what I have with Nike, it's honestly been the opposite. The most issues that I've had were with small studios in Amsterdam that weren't even international. They were just literally based in one city and they would make an issue of you teaching somewhere else or you teaching classes online. And I noticed though in Amsterdam, they're starting, we're starting to have this little breakthrough where more and more studios start to offer agreements without non-competes because it's kind of insane to claim trainers who are earning not an insane amount of money by teaching classes. So can't really claim them. Like it's, it's almost unfair, you know, got to pay your rent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you want people to, as you say, you want people to be enterprising and do their own things, don't you? Because as long as people are, you know, representing the company well, it's, it's good that they're doing their own thing. Absolutely. I, that's you now that I have my own business and I start to kind of like choose who am I going to reach out to, to work with and to collaborate with. I'm looking for people who are, creative, who are launching things, who are, you know, like who are in the midst of the business and really try to do, yeah, more and more projects. Those are the people I'm super interested to work with because they represent something. They are determined. So yeah, I, I definitely see that a lot of companies make a mistake there. Your city, Amsterdam, I've had the privilege to visit it a bit more than your average kind of stag do person from the uk <laughs> they, they they see this this the small area where all the bad things happen but is, <laughs> is there a good is there a good fitness scene there in the city i would say it, it's hard here not to compare with other cities right so because i lived in london i've seen a fitness scene that for me was very inspiring same as for new york and la for example those are like the vahalas for fitness in my opinion but then Amsterdam is great at launching studios and and uh, concepts. I just think that what we're lacking in Amsterdam is creativity and, you know, the boldness to try something new. What happens mainly is, oh, okay, they're doing something that works. We're going to copy the exact same thing, give it a different color and launch it. And that happens a lot worldwide, obviously, but in Amsterdam, it's uh, at the moment, it's like, I think that, that we're kind of missing the, the knowledge. We're kind of missing the, the need to be new, the need to be different. And what I see from London, from Los Angeles, from New York, those are like the main things. People are launching something even better. And then this happens. And then there's this new thing. And that just keeps evolving. And we're not there yet in Amsterdam. Okay. But I, I guess uh, it feels like a very pretty healthy, well, as I say, apart from the, the the bit where we all go on, on stag parties, it seems like a, quite a healthy place. You know, everyone's moving, everyone's cycling and... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, it's quite I outdoorsy, definitely. you know. And... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm impressed definitely by, by the level of, you know, people's health and fitness kind of in, uh, in Amsterdam in general. Yeah. It's pretty good, especially also compared to a lot of the rest of the country, I would say they're, they're really? definitely, but there's also, there's a lot, there's maybe even a little bit too much offering at the moment. You could tell that studios are struggling because more and more studios start to open and boutiques start to open. So yeah, you can tell that we don't, you know, it's a small freaking city. Like <laughs> we have like, I think maybe 800,000 people or something and 8 million in London, right? Yeah, yeah, that's small. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you can walk across, you can walk across Amsterdam, can't you? In yes. 
Yeah. So that. imagine if one studio has a location in Amsterdam, but they have maybe four locations. It's almost like, whoa, you know, like it's tiny. <laughs> Do we need four locations? I understand yeah. that, you know, from a business perspective that you're trying, but you can tell that there were kind of collapsing. It's just an overkill. Okay. So they just saturated it, not enough people. Yeah. It mentions mindfulness on your website too. Yeah. Is this, this, this is something that I've gone, I've come full circle on a bit like musical theater in that like I, from the outside, it sounded like nonsense to me, but I did a podcast a couple of years back with a mindfulness teacher. I thought it was amazing. How did you get into it? I would say the main reason why I got into it is because of my mom. She is now a holistic coach, but she's always been um, raising me in a mindful way, a spiritual way. She was always seeking for new spiritual healing ways and she was into uh reiki i don't know if you know that but mm. uh, yeah like i don't know she always showed me that there is this whole other world when it comes down to healing when it comes down to taking care of yourself that has been very inspiring in my life so that was the first kind of way how i got interested in reading maybe more spiritual books or mindfulness books and yeah that's how i kind of got into that side of it. Here's, a easy, here's an easy slash difficult question. What What is mild, my, what is mindfulness? This is really an easy slash difficult question. So I always, when someone asks me like this, I, I could like, we can answer the correct Google answer, but I'm naturally these type of questions for me, I just like to answer what it means to me. Mindfulness to me means being in a state being in a mindful state, being in a state of being present, being aware, and being here, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. Instead of being obsessed with going somewhere, instead of being obsessed with judging yourself or putting pressure on yourself, just being present, being mindful, taking in what happens and being here. Yeah, that's a that's a decent explanation, and I think I think to to your point before, even if you say formulate a brilliant explanation of what mindfulness is of your own, if someone asks you the question a month later, because of the nature of what you're talking about, you shouldn't just give the, an answer you've already got. You because you know you, you're supposed to think about it because because it means different things as you as you go along, right? Which is why. It's easy for from the outside to reject it and say it sounds like nonsense because it can mean it could be nothing. And this is this is the position I was in before I kind of had it explained to me properly and talked about it properly. And I think the word has become polluted a little bit. Like for example, here on the underground, they say, "Be mindful of your other passengers" and stuff like this. And I understand they're saying, you know, be nice to each other and don't. Yeah, be humble. Place, but it kind of. <laughs> It kind of detracts from the use of the concept if you're hearing it all the time on a on a tannoy announcement, you know. So, so true, so true. At one point, things become start becoming a trend or a hit, and then it kind of loses the yeah the the meaning or the intention of it. I do what I love to use mindful for is I would in general say that I teach mindful movement. And that comes back to those core values that I was explaining, right? In my class, like for me, it's most important that people start listening to their body, move with your body, not against it. I'm not the type of coach who would guide you into a class where you're forcing something, but where you're trying something, where you are allowing yourself to try something new, to explore, to have fun with it, to enjoy it, rather than being obsessed with the result. And those things kind of add on for me to to the mindfulness part. Yeah, and I think I think that that sounds really good because I think the big problem in in exercise is when say somebody's out of shape and they've got a long way to go to where they want to be. If they then spend the first few months not happy where they are now because all they're thinking about is getting rid of this belly or whatever it is they want to do to arrive at this point, if they haven't 
kind of accepted where they are now, then it, they're going to be they're going to be pushing against something rather than you know rather than accepting and 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 doing what they need to do in the present. So true, so true. And and the problem with that is it doesn't last. It's 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 frustrating whenever you roll out your mat or you clip into your bike, you, you don't feel well. And that kind of takes out all of the joy of the journey because to be arriving at a certain result or an achievement is usually and often not as satisfying as you think it will be during the journey. So it's so important to make that, that way that you're, you know, like that path that you're taking the road to make that pleasant, to make that meaningful, to make that something positive, something you look out, you look forward to. Yeah. And it, and it has to contribute to your, to your life in the present, right? You know, you have to, Absolutely. you have to sort of feel that you would, ex- if you, if it was your last day on earth, would you, would you not exercise? This is, I think this is a question that, because I think people who are not that into it, they'd say, well, brilliant what's the point you know i don't have to because yeah. you know like you know like in groundhog day when he's eating he's eating the, he can eat the cakes because he's you know it there's no consequence but, <laughs> yes. but, it, but but you know you don't need telling this but it exercises fulfilling now right you feel you feel better in an hour so i think if you yeah put that question yourself and if you would do it on your last day well you know you're not going to make a an appreciable difference to how you look yeah. you're going to make a difference to how you feel so true. So true. I often say during my classes, don't think about the looks. Stop focusing on the looks. Start focusing on the feels, the feeling of it. And there's still a lot of people in class and they take my classes weekly who need to hear it over and over again. Well, things don't go in, you see. I've definitely found this with myself. You hear things from teachers and trainers the the my two sports martial arts and yoga is what I do right and and I've heard things from my instructor or my yoga teacher and they've said it to me like three or four years ago and I've finally gone ah <laughs> yeah finally I see what you mean but it's that is that's literally that has to do with timing the sweet say that's so true I have the same thing like I could listen to a podcast or read a book I read a book years ago and then you read you read it years later because like you see the title and you're like oh yeah i think i read that let me read it again and then it hits <laughs> but i read the exact same book and it just didn't hit me back then so it's like you'll you'll take exactly those you know those little bites in class that you need yeah exactly and you got you've got to be receptive but it also it also it makes a big difference how much the instructor's putting into it right because if if someone, if someone like my yoga classes, most of them are the, the, it's a set sequence, right? So they're often saying the same things over and over again. And some of them, you can kind of hear they're going through a script and they've done this a thousand times and they're kind of <laughs> robotically saying. And if you say things to someone robotically, you're diminishing the chances hugely that it's going to have an effect. And same as like we were saying about trying to define mindfulness. If you're if you as instructor, you're really there and you're thinking on your feet and you're actually experiencing it rather than, you know, passing on some knowledge that you've received. If you're actually there with them, there's a, you know, there's a bigger chance that they'll hear it. So oh, but true. some people still, it's not going to go in like me for years, but. <laughs> yeah, that's timing, I guess. <laughs> or ignorance. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a very, I'm a very bad student. It takes a long, it takes a long time. Oh, I get what you meant years ago oh, now. Oh yeah. Now I get it. Why didn't you, you tell me? told me before. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, it's that's so funny because I often get the question of people who take my class, like or of trainers, of fellow trainers. How do you know what to say during class? And I'm like, that's that's it's not a topic, it's not a thing. I tune into the class. One thing that I'm very good at while I move my body is to be present, to be in a moment. It's my number one meditation practice to move, to be honest. My number one practice to just be here, get out of my head, is to move my body. So for me, it's 
it's easy to coach and to guide and to kind of like, I don't know, just let it flow. And the things I say at that moment often touch people in very different ways. People with complete different stories, they need to hear something completely different. And then they'll come after class with a similar, you know, they'll tell me like, oh, I really loved when you started talking about, you know, uh, whatever, listening to my heart. And then I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I said that, but I said something that made you realize you want to listen to your heart or something. You know what I mean? Like yeah, they'll hear yeah. what they need to hear. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point actually. Why well, you just take it anyway. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm taking all You're of welcome. it. Oh, thank you so much. I knew you Passing on the wisdom. <laughs> I knew you needed that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if we, Talk about your scars. No, yeah, definitely. I know you may be maybe bored of talking about this, but I know as someone I have scars on my leg myself. And I did a podcast with a guy who, who's um an amputee a few weeks ago. And he was talking about he's saying it took him a long time to be able to show his scars in public and he was very embarrassed. So so you've got heavy scarring on your legs since childhood, right? Yes, that's right. Since childhood, since I am since I was two years old, actually. So, so I so can't you, remember a life without. Okay, so this is always been this has always been it for you. And yeah. You don't remember not having, but do you do you remember sort of it ever being an issue for you as a child or yeah, definitely. I for me, I think the hardest time that I had with my scars was when I was a teenager. I really remember hiding it, being embarrassed to, you know, go out and swimming with friends or with school or on holidays. It would be, you know, we would go on holidays to Tunisia. My father is from Tunisia. We would visit there for the summers and I would like wear long pants while it was, I don't know, you know, bloody hot. <laughs> so I really remember that that was a time for me and it took pretty long that I was, that I was really hiding it. And then there came a phase where I was like, I can't hide it any longer, but I also wasn't really accepting it, which was like my, my, I want to say end teenager years, but also beginning twenties. And it wasn't until I, yeah, literally, I want to say like done, done inner work, meditation, writing about it, journaling about it, being honest and sharing my feelings about it. And then I was ready to share it publicly. So it wasn't like, it wasn't sort of one day you remember thinking, right, I'm done about this. It was a slow acceptance, was it? It definitely was a slow acceptance. I do remember like certain little anchors and moments in my life where it inspired me or where I felt inspired or where someone said something to me. I remember being at a festival one time and that was one of the first festivals or parties where I would go with shorts. So I was wearing shorts and I was wearing my Dr. Martin boots and someone came up to me and said, damn, like you look cool. Like a girl, actually, she was like, your, your scars, like, I don't know, this whole look, I'm loving it. And it just, it never left me. I was like, wow. You know, I was like looking at myself, like it is pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know. That's amazing. I think it is cool. And that particularly you know, next to the fact that, you know, you're super in shape and, you know, pushing people and and inspiring other people. I think it's, I think it's great because it's horrible that people would feel, you know, and it must have been difficult as a teenager because I guess as a little child, you did you not really care? And then the awkwardness came when you were older. I thought so. But my mom recently, we, we sometimes talk about this because I get curious to how it was for them and what, you know, what they've witnessed and noticed about me. And I remember I saw a lot of photos of myself as a kid with leggings while I was swimming. So like a, a bathing suit with leggings under it. And I asked my mom, like, you know, like, was that necessary for the scars? Like, I, I, I just was confused about that. And my mom said, no, actually, you um told me that your scars were hurting in the water which wasn't really the case we'd say because it was years after it happened and before that I would have worn just a bathing suit without the leggings 
And so my mom kind of realized like, okay, probably she's not really comfortable with this. I want to say I was about seven years old or something mm. at that time, seven, eight. And so my mom was like, sure, uh, we'll get you some leggings. Maybe it will help a little bit better. You know, maybe it will make you feel better. And then it was like, indeed, after that, everything was fine. Jeez. So apparently there was, yeah, something going on there. Kids are pretty robust. It must have been a very traumatic experience for your mother and your and your father. Yeah, my father. Yes, yeah. And for my brother as well. He's a little bit older than I am. Yeah, that was, I, I, I honestly... I don't have kids of myself at the moment, but I have like a little niece that the daughter of my brother. And even that bond that I have with her, I just, I sometimes think about my parents, just admire the fact that they, yeah, they moved on and that they, you know, gave me my freedom, you know, back. It wasn't like they were super overprotected over me or something. They just, you know, yeah, they dealt with it. I, th I think it's, unbelievable to be honest so it was meningitis c how that's you right swear. and so and, and by the sounds of it you were quite lucky to live through it and certainly to keep your legs yeah Is that yeah 100 percent. i've i was i think i was in in coma at least for a week and by then there was no vaccination for it yet and so to my understanding was 90% of the people with this bacteria wouldn't make it, especially in the stage where I was. So it was like live or die. And yeah, I guess that also helped me a lot in a later stage of my life to realize, to, to embrace that part of me. It, it, you know, it wasn't, like this little dumb accident or this thing, you know, that happened to me and like, oh, bad luck. It, it, it feels like, you know, it, it could have been different, could have not been here anymore. And then to have the ability to be so active and move my body in a certain way, that's something, that's a privilege. I can't take that for granted. So that helped me with the whole process of just accepting uh, the way it is and the scars. Did you, once you'd re recovered from all that awful stuff, beyond the scarring, did you have any other effects, long-term long, long -term effects on your body? No, actually, I, I got, in that sense, very lucky with, I remember my, my doctor always said, you have very healthy scars. Like, you're very lucky with these healthy scars. So that was something that I kept repeating for myself. These are healthy scars. I'm lucky with them. So no, actually, I, I, there was never, not even like with the maintenance of the scars, because I was tiny, you know, I was like two years old when it happened. So the scars had to be able to grow along, uh, to grow along. And that, to my remem uh, remembering, went flawless. I like this healthy scars is a nice way of looking at it, because it's really that they've, that's your body doing really good work to mend itself, right? And to allow yes allow you to live normally and move it move as you want it's just it's put the proper good work in to fix you hasn't it so it really did it really did yeah so maybe everyone should see scars like that you know i think people you know rather than, than as a thing you wish hadn't happened you think well the thing happened anyway and the the scars are the good work in healing you yeah this is so true it took me so many years to develop that perspective and that mindset about it but now that i have it is really a part of me where you know i if someone would offer me to whatever like magically I take know, it, yeah, it, 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 boo, no more scars i would literally say thanks but no thanks i'm good especially what they've done for me personally for my character I would say they've they're significant to my life. Yeah, because you can't even if you can, I mean, you know, it works as an intellectual exercise to abracadabra things away, but you, even if you even if you could like back to the future things, you don't know what 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 else, you know, what how much they've contributed to you being the person I see today. You no, know, maybe you'd have no. been like, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
fist. Slap my face. <laughs> Very angry coach. Oh, maybe. Or not even a coach. Maybe some, I don't want to, I don't want to choose a profession that uh, to look no. bad, but, you know, doing something that you don't want to do that angry gives you bird. no tools. But, yeah. Just really <laughs> pissed off. It's so true. It's so true. And, and also, you know, we're living in crazy times right now with this whole social media. Uh, um, there's just a lot of standards we feel. I'm, I'm a millennial personally, and my generation is trying to live up to standards that are not realistic. And this whole part hasn't affected me so much because I think of my my journey and my scars and everything that happened there. I just started, you know, learning to accept my body for what it is. And I love to move my body. I love to train. I love to feel fit, but I, my motivation to do that is not to, you know, hold up a certain look or yeah, live up to standards visually or how do you say like the way I look but more the way I feel and that focus has been a leading game for me and yeah that really helped me deal with self-doubt with insecurities really did have you have you had any difficulty as your kind of online following's grown have you have you had any difficulty coping with the size of it do you ever have the kind of like want to be left alone what do you mean? When do, where, does it does the whole on the whole social media thing? Because you've got a lot of followers now, you must get negative attention. You must get lots of people contacting you. Does it ever get too much? This is a good question because, funny enough, this there's not a lot of negative things. This is not an invite, by the way, for anybody <laughs> for anybody who wants to throw negativity. <laughs> no, but like there's there, yeah, not not really haters or something. Obviously, there's sometimes maybe have been an a comment not to my liking or something, but I'm the type of person either I'll delete it or I'll answer with a smile or I don't answer. But yeah, so that I didn't I never really felt that impact or something. Um, what I do have to be aware of for myself is there, there's a lot of demand. Oh, can you, can you, you should do this. You should do that. You should post more of this. You should share more of that. And that for me can be very overwhelming. So I'm not really digging into my DMS to be honest. Like my, no, I think that, I think that's, that's very wise. And, and, and what you said at the second, second pit was kind of more what I mean. I think, yeah, if, if when you've got the sort of, level you're at if you start going into the dms you're gonna it's gonna end, oh, yeah. gonna no. end very badly <laughs> but but yeah even even po even positive stuff can become too much right because you've only got so much time in the day because everyone wants to be successful you know they want to take the opportunities that the success gives but you you can't be on your phone all day you know you, yeah because it you wouldn't it be more than you yeah, this is this is important. This is definitely something where everybody has to find their own way and it takes a while to understand, all right, wait a second. You know, you get this whatever like reality check where you realize, okay, I've been on my phone or I've been doing this way too much or maybe it's an issue with, you know, people around you who are maybe reminding you like please get off the phone. For me, it's it's it has a lot to do with work and business. So I start, you know, I started carving out time in my schedule of like, okay, that's a great moment for me to post. That's a great moment for me to post. And I love to interact with my community. Um, but I give myself, let's say, for example, 15 minutes to go through some comments to respond to what I want to respond to. And then that was the time for today. Time's up. Yeah, that's the way you've got. You've got to decide beforehand. You've got to. You've got to divide your. It's just as you yeah. decide you're going to exercise at this time. Yeah. You can't just allow it to bleed into. No, because it's tempting. First of all, indeed, to 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 respond to that, but I also think that living this mindful life that I desire to inspire my members or the people who take my classes to that is not something that's included into that. Like there's just, 
there's other ways to to give and to respond and to share with people. Like I I love to be honest. I love to create things, also free content. And so that's where people can get, you know, little bits and pieces of you of or for what of what you create, but it's not reasonable to be obsessed with yeah, the responding and the demands and it's just I don't think it's going to give me a great satisfaction if I'm going to focus fully on that. No, you need to give yourself space in your own life, don't you? Space is it. Yeah, well, you're doing an amazing job. I mean, you're putting out incredible positivity. If people, so your your online business is Elevate by Rowan, R-O-W-E-N. Yes. On Instagram, you're Rowan Aida. Yeah, that's right. The people can find you there and they can sign up for your online business and get so you do so you do some free stuff on insta but then when people sign up they become like deep members do they and they get special yes. stuff <laughs> they get the special stuff you get all the special stuff if you're a member <laughs> no so on youtube also i have like some free workouts for people who do not or either do not have the budget to be a member or who are just yeah, want to have one or two classes a month or something, that's something else. But if you want to move and work out with me and meditate with me and you want to become a member, then yeah, you get all of the content that I create. Amazing. Well, we've burnt through our hour. It's been amazing to you. <laughs> you too. Such an honor to be here on the podcast. Thank you so much. And yeah, I love what you do. I really love what you do. I just wanted to say that before we end this conversation. Well, thank you so much. Well, best of luck with everything, Rowan. Thank you right, so much. Thank you very much. Take care.